Hi, I'm Kyle Workerly, Certified Professional Ghostwriter. I'm glad you're listening as I welcome industry experts to share stories of lessons learned the hard way, overcoming professional hurdles, turning experience into actual knowledge, and how to connect with your target audience. This is the Career Challenges Podcast. Welcome to the Career Challenges Podcast, and my guest for this episode is Barry Magliaditi. And Barry is a human behavior archaeologist based in Bali. Currently, he's back in Australia, and is here to facilitate sustainable heart-based change that affects all aspects of life in a positive way. So, Barry, thank you so much for being on the Career Challenges Podcast with me today. Thanks for having me. All right, all right. And, of course, you're, you're, you're back in Australia, like I mentioned, and that's uh, just because of the pandemic that we have going on here. Uh, yeah, well, not, not exactly. I live in Bali. Um, <clears throat> I've got two children that live in Perth, so I spend school holidays with them. Um, we had an event that we're running here and a few other things, so I needed to do a visa run, and it just it was unfortunate that it happened before the lockdowns happened. Uh, much prefer to be in Bali right now, mm-hmm. but uh, also happy to be here and happy to see my kids once they let me out of self-isolation. Definitely, definitely. Always, always important to be around family at this time. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm, I'm curious too, uh, why Bali? Did it just make more sense for your business to run from there or you know, were there other factors that were involved? No, look, long story short, um, went, through a, went through a relationship breakup towards the end of last year mm. and uh, we had planned to travel this year for 12 months. So all the plans that I'd made was to exit myself from my business operationally. Uh, we organized getting rid of our house, putting our stuff in storage and obviously after we se- separated uh, those plans were still in place, and although I didn't, I didn't really feel the same desire to to want to travel. I've done a lot of traveling, and for me, I'm probably prefer to to look at creating a bit of a base. I decided to go to Bali for a couple of months just to chill out and see what was next. And uh, just so happened when I was over there, a, a mate who's been living there was looking to renew a lease for twelve months, and I was like, "Hey, let me jump on on that. I'm really enjoying the lifestyle." And to be honest, like I've I've spent a lot of time in many parts of the world, and it's very hard to beat the quality of lifestyle that you have in, in Bali, you know, there's great surf, phenomenal food, beautiful people, uh, good weather all the time. It's, yeah, it's a very good place to live. Yeah. And where, where is Bali again? I have a map up on the lawn for me. I'm trying to find it real fast, but it's somewhere uh, north, northwest of Australia, essentially it's, it's three and a half, four hours flight from Perth. Okay. Um, the moment. So just a, a short little hop and a skip, right? Yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I, we went to Hawaii a few years ago, but that was a full day flight just to get out there. So, you know, Bali is probably a much better uh, option for you guys out there in Australia. Yeah. yeah it's awesome. a good place. So you, you run the game changers and, uh, can you explain to me how the kind of your, your motivation behind that company? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's interesting cause I look back at where I was nine years ago. I look back at where I was 17 years ago and, um, never thought I'd be here. I 34 years old and started my first business at 17. So I've been literally in business for half my life. And, uh, <clears throat> when I kind of first went to business, I had a passion for, um, carpentry and anything related to my hands and grew a, a carpentry business very, very quick, a kitchen and bathroom manufacturing business to a couple million dollars in turnover in a very short period of time. And then uh, seemingly over light, overnight, my life uh, slipped away from me and fell apart. You know, my relationships broke down. I didn't have a social network around me. Uh, cash started becoming an issue. And I had a, a multi-million dollar business that relied on me, a multi-million dollar job. That if I stepped out, even for a moment, the thing seemingly fell apart. And although we were growing and we we're growing fast, um, in that type of business where you're required to put a lot of cash back into resource to fund upcoming work, we were essentially growing faster than we could we could keep up with. And uh, had some challenges with my relationship where I was never home. When I was home, I was not present. I was always thinking about business. And mm-hmm. after being with her for eight years, eight and a half years, she decided that it was time for her to kind of move on, that she couldn't do that lifestyle anymore. And for me, I was a bit bewildered at the time not kind of understanding how here I was committing and dedicating my life to, to my family or what I thought was to my family to provide for them uh, that she could walk away. But what I realized a few weeks after we had that, that conversation is that 
uh, in actual fact, it wasn't about providing for my, finan- for my family financially, it was about providing for my family emotionally. And I was not doing a very good job of, of either at that point in time. And so uh, that caused the, the transition for me to exit that business and to get out of that business and to kind of go on a bit of a journey inwards to work at how I'd messed my life up so bad. You know, I was a very spiritual and religious uh, person at the time and uh, had a very strong religious practice and couldn't understand how that was happening to me. But at the same time, I felt in my heart that there was a reason I was going through it. Even though I was still to this day one of the most challenging experiences of my life, I felt a strong calling in my heart. There was a reason I was, I was facing and going through those situations. And I believe that, you know, God never gives us anything that we haven't already got the solutions for. Sure. And that essentially led me to starting to understand more around psychotherapies, around NLP, around quantum physics, and around a whole bunch of different uh, elements of the human experience outside of spirituality and religion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was learning all this stuff and seeing some amazing benefits and changes in my life that I felt it was too good not to share with others, but never had the intention to coach businesses because from my perspective, I was a failed business owner, but I had these tools that could create some change. And so I was, I was out there finding people that had phobias or fears or limiting beliefs or challenging situations in their life that was holding them back. And I was using these tools and skill sets that in many ways, there were, there were tools that I had my whole life. I just never saw them as that. And going through uh, a diploma in life coaching and learning psychology and things helped to start to unlock that. And, uh, you know, sure enough, a year or so after I started to work with clients, one day I woke up and realized that all my clients were business owners. <laughs> and the even funnier thing is that all of them had started to, 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 to share with me time and time again how they're seeing a huge impact and growth in their business, both financially, profitably, and the time they spend in their business as a result of the work they're doing with me on, their, on what we call the inner game, on mm-hmm. you know, the inner workings of them and the human experience. And I was like, well, this is really funny how I've attracted business owners. I don't see myself as a business coach. Um, you know, I kept working with clients in that space for probably another two years before I kind of got over my own stuff around my perceptions of what my past was Mm -hmm. and started to more actively seek out business owners to work with. And, you know, here we are kind of eight, eight, eight odd years later, we've got a community currently of over a hundred business owners that are paying us actively for our services. Um, We've impacted millions of people through our podcast and, you know, made a huge difference to so many people's lives through the work that we do. And through me essentially stepping into the discomfort of, of what was showing up for me. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. So when you, when you started, uh, I guess on your, your path and, and looking inward, uh, did you have your own coach for that or were there, I guess, books and thought leaders that you were following at the time? Yeah, it was funny. Just before uh, I shut up shop in, in that first business, um, I hired a coach and it was almost too little too late, but in many ways to possibly not even the right coach. But the one gift that he gave me was, open my eyes to this element of coaching. And uh, prior to that, I I was definitely learning to some degree, but nowhere near like after that. After Mm -hmm. that, I basically went on a journey where every dollar I made, I reinvested back into my education. Whether that was, you know, the the first was audio book, it was Tony Robbins. You know, I Mm -hmm. listened to the second track of Tony Robbins and I was like, right, that's that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to learn the skills to help people not go through what I just put myself through. Mm-hmm. was kind of the motivation of where it all started. And so every cent I invested back into audio books, into physical books, into workshops, into programs. And I had, you know, a whole house full of shelf help. And, you know, it was a few years down the track that I realized that it was time to kind of stop investing so heavily and so sporadically and start to really utilize the learnings and the gifts that I've had. And I've always had coaches and mentors since then and still to this day. Um, but the way that I used them, uh, and utilize them now is very different to what it was back then. Mm. You know, back then there was a lot of reliance on them because I was, I was in many ways very broken and lost uh, compared to now. They're more of an advisory board and, you know, there's conversations that happen, not always taken on board what's shared, but they're a good sounding board to, to kind of run through the, the noise that, that uh, we all have inside our heads. Yeah, definitely. I, I sometimes get a lot of noise in my head still today. <laughs> something I'm working on. Um, So when you, I guess your first client, can you, I guess, explain to me what that was like, you know, connecting with this person to saying, well, you know, I can help them. And so here's what I'm going to do to make sure that they don't go through what I went through. Can you walk me through that? 
Uh, yeah, it was a bit of an interesting situation. So I'd uh, shut up shop in Tassie where I was. I'd, I'd moved to WA to try to re- rebuild a relationship with my mother and my children and my, my kids. Um, and I decided to reopen up a kitchen business again mm-hmm. and kind of follow the, the same footpath because it's what I knew. And I just finished my first intake weekend uh, with a coaching institute in uh, Melbourne, in Australia. And I went to these people's houses to uh, finish fitting off their kitchen and picking up, pick up a check. And I don't even know how it happened, but I started to chat to this woman, uh, elderly, elderly woman, kind of late, late fifties, I guess. Mm-hmm. And she started to open up with me and share things with me that she said she'd never shared with anyone before. Oh. And she started sharing with me that, uh, you know, she, she can't remember the last time that she was happy and that, you know, as her years go by, the more and more unhappy that she becomes, the more and more isolated she feels, the more she wants to stay inside. And her husband <clears throat> commented and shared as well. That he's like, I haven't seen my wife smile. And, uh, Oh my gosh. And she started sharing with me that she had this uh, sexual abuse back when mm. she was, I think it was 11 years old at the time. Mm. And I'm standing in there and, and I, I can only tell you that what it felt like was just, you know, God's blessing, God's love just flowing through me. Like there was just this intrinsic need mm. or understanding that, that I could help this woman and I had the tools to help her, even though I had no idea, really kind of had no idea what I was doing. I felt it so strongly in me. And I started asking her questions and before I knew it, she's bawling her eyes out, sharing with me her, her life story. And I took her through a process that I'd learned and in a matter of five to 10 minutes, completely cleared the trauma and the emotion around this event that she'd held on to for 40 odd years. Oh and I'll never forget her partner walked back in the door, her husband walked back in the door and he's like, holy shit. He said, in all my years, I've been married to my wife. I've never seen a smile until this day. And I still, I still get tingles to this day sharing that because I jumped in my, my car and I drove home and I was bawling my eyes out and it was between this intense emotion and almost like a clearing of my own, my own stuff mm-hmm. and shedding of my own skin. But then there was complete tears of joy that just this very short conversation had such a significant impact on this woman who's carried this for you know most of her life. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, a humbling experience probably, right? Hugely, yeah. 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 It's, it makes me realize like I've not, not a situation like that, but you know, I've helped people and it's, I've seen kind of what's come of that, that help. It, it makes me feel small, but in a good way, you know, yeah. realizing I've done something for somebody else and maybe it wasn't necessarily all me. Maybe mostly it was God. It probably was mostly God. Um, but seeing that and it's like, wow, that's, that's amazing that I got to play a small yet integral part in that story. So, yeah, absolutely. yeah. Um, so when we, we when we first connected, uh, and I talked, or I'd I'd ask you what's kind of a challenge or an obstacle that you face, and you talked about a vulnerable and authentic leader. Um, you know, I've heard authentic used a lot in, in leadership circles and how to be a better leader, and sometimes people throw that around. But you were the first one to mention vulnerability uh, as a key element of leadership. Mm-hmm. So, so why that that word? Yeah. Um, great question. I guess as long as I can remember, I would say that I've been a a very poor leader. Um, I'm very good at doing the do, but I'm not so good at, um, I guess, helping others do the do and, Mm -hmm. uh, probably being a bit hard on myself, but, but, but that's kind of the way that I have seen myself. And I remember a couple of years ago, my relationship really was starting to call on me to step more into who I was and step more into what I was feeling and what I was knowing inside of me rather than uh, projecting in many ways the the shields of my wounds, right, to keep me safe. Mm-hmm. And so I started to, I would go to these personal development events um, more recent times, like a couple of years ago. And I remember that I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could share what was going on because there was an aspect of me going, oh, I'm supposed to be a coach. I'm supposed to have my stuff together. I can't share with these people what's really going on. All the voices in my head and all the stuff that I tell myself. And I remember one workshop, I don't know whether it was that I moved to a place inside of myself or whether I, you know, um, whether they made me feel safe enough, but there was one workshop. I thought I'm going all in here and I'm going to express and I'm going to share wholeheartedly what's going on for me. And it was the most freeing experience of my life because what I realized is that everyone else in the room had the same stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And when I shared that, I actually allowed everyone else in the room to have a deeper experience. 
because I had I had the courage and I had the vulnerability to share what was really going on without the masks, without the covers. And it gave permission to everyone else in the room to go there as well. And it was one of the, still to this day, one of the most, one of the deepest and most humbling experiences in my life. And that to me was a key. I'm like, wow, me sharing what was really going on vulnerably, like they're not judging me. And if they are, who cares anyway? But True. I feel so free and I'm empowering others. I've empowered others to do the same. And I took that back to my team. And the next team meeting I had, I, I had a talk with them around vulnerability. And I said, I would love us all to share something here that we've never shared with anyone else before in our lives. And I'm going to start first. And I shared with them something about me. And it was so deep and so vulnerable. I never shared it before. Next minute, I had 10 of my team members sharing their deepest fears, their deepest vulnerabilities, stuff that never shared with anyone before. And number one, it brought us all closer together as a mm-hmm. team. Uh, number two, it allowed us to all feel safer and more united. Number three, there was a huge impact on culture and productivity that they felt that they could share what was going on and be respected, be heard, be seen in all of their stuff. And, you know, I've taken that experience into the rooms, that, you know, the, the rooms that I facilitate now, like it might be a room of a hundred strangers. You know, I will, I will facilitate everyone to be raw and vulnerable. And it's amazing at everyone's core once that's shared, how united they become. And so that's where I see leadership going as a whole, you know, mm-hmm. gone are the days you can run this, this hierarchical military type structure leadership. Like it's yeah. just people have too much choice. Like, especially look at what's going on right now with the COVID-19 situation. Like everything materialistically that's meant stuff to people is being taken away and stripped back. And what we're being faced with is who we are at our core, who we are at our core belief and identity of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I think that vulnerability has such a powerful medicine to be able to heal so many others when, we can share that stuff because we're no longer hiding behind shame. We're no longer hiding behind guilt. We're being seen in all of us. And I believe that God made us perfectly with free will. And that free will was the ability to choose both directions and both sides and still be loved. Mm-hmm. Right? And why we're not sharing those aspects of us or why we're holding onto those aspects of us, we're, we're hiding those aspects of us from God. We're hiding those aspects of us from being healed when they're seen anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, People see this stuff anyway, whether they know what it is, they see it in us. So the more that we can express and be vulnerable, the more that we actually become magnetized and attract people in. People want strong leaders. People want people that aren't afraid of their own stuff. Mm -hmm. True, true. So for a leader who I guess wants to be better or somebody who just wants to have a more genuine connection with the people around them, I mean, what would be a good first step for kind of stepping into vulnerability? Um, I'm, I'm sure it's not like a, you know, an ABC and now you're vulnerable, but what is one thing that they can do to get, I guess, be more vulnerable with the people around them? Um, yeah, I, th- I think lead. I think be okay to speak out what's going on in your head. Like, you know, especially right now with everything's going on, if you're uncertain about the, about the future of your business, share that with your team. Just say, look, guys. Uh, honestly, I'm feeling really uncertain around the state of the business and where we're at, you know, cash has been tight for a while and this has been happening and, mm-hmm. you know, we're losing clients. I'm, I'm, I've got some concerns. I'm feeling a bit fearful. And that being said, you know, I want to share that with you and also share with you that I'm going to fight to the end to ensure that we come through this and each of you guys maintain your jobs in the meantime. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Right. That's, yeah. that brings people around that mm-hmm. common vision as opposed to you, on the inside feeling scared, but on the outside be like, Oh, we're all good. We're going to get through this. Mm. Like, no, like share what's going on. As long as the vulnerability is not coming in the form of whinging or whining or complaining, there's a difference. There's a difference. You know, yeah. vulnerability is owning, owning your feelings as opposed to, you know, being, being the martyr and, and trying to express for uh, someone to, to pat you on the back and be like, now, now it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. So I think, just start off small, start to share what's going on in your head. And the more that you start to share those little voices with people around you, the more you start to realize that everyone has them, that they're okay and that you're safe to fully express who you are. And, you know, if people are going to judge you, it's going to create some separation. The question I've got for you is were those people ever really there in the, in, 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 at the first place at all? Sure. Like if you sharing your truest expression is going to cause people to not want to be friends with you or not really hang around you anymore it's not a real friendship anyway, because you're only showing up the way you think that they need you to be, not who you actually are. Mm. Sure. You know, sure. It's a great point. It's a great point. Um, so you're, as you're, you're building up or I guess you're, you're coaching more without realizing, I guess I should say, um, where was that moment for you when you realized, you know, I'm, 
I'm helping people consistently, mm -hmm. effectively. Maybe I should look into this as a, a you know a legitimate enterprise for me, where I'm helping more people on a regular basis. Um, I, I guess the moment that I like, I took on board the course, and that was really to kind of learn how I'd mess myself up so bad. But at the same time, after that that city with Tony Robbins, I guess it was like, wow, like if I could do anything, I'd love to. I'd love to be like a Tony Robbins. I'd love to be a coach and to be able to impact people's lives in a positive way to not experience what I did. So I had that vision right from the get go, you know, I, I did the course um, and I kind of made a decision. I remember speaking to a, a lady at the course. I, I made a decision that I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, it's going to work. I need to charge for my services because they were kind of advocating to go and do pro bono work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, if, I, if I'm going to do this, I need to subsidize my income that I'm not doing something else because I'm, I'm broke. I've just been through bankruptcy and I need to, to get some cash coming back in. Mm -hmm. um, so I just started charging a, a base nominal fee for that. And um, it's been an ongoing journey, you know, up, up until probably 18 months ago, it was an ongoing journey noticing how my level of self-worth was directly impacting what I thought I could charge um, and who I thought I could help. And, mm -hmm. you know, 18 months ago that significantly shifted and I realized that, you know, whether we charge a high price or low price is irrelevant. Like we live in an ecosystem, we're always going to attract people that, that are congruent with who we're being. And the more we can authentically be ourselves, the more we're going to authentically charge the prices that we feel is, is worth charging and we'll attract the clients around that. You know, like we've upped our prices several times within our programs, but mm -hmm. the programs are still ridiculously cheap to the value that we give and the, the results we generate for our clients and their businesses. Um, so I guess it's an ongoing thing, but, but to be honest with you too, mate, is that for a long time I felt... I felt like a fraud and you know, mm -hmm. I know a lot of business owners feel the same way. Like I, I speak yeah. to and interview a lot of business owners on our podcast, the comeback game. And a lot of them have had experiences or, or consistently have experiences where they feel like a fraud. Mm -hmm. They're like, how did I get here? Like if people only knew who I really was, but it's like, it's just, it's just, it's just part of the part of the journey, you know, uh, is to notice that stuff inside of you, name it, and then just keep moving forwards because ultimately this is not about you. It's about, the people that you're serving, the people that you're helping and the people you're contributing to. True. So does it tie back into the, you know, that vulnerability that we talked about earlier? Absolutely. Yep. Definitely. Definitely. I can see the a huge connection there. Um, so when you decided to go into coaching full time, um, you know, what were some of those challenges? I mean, just beyond, you know, making sure that you had money coming in. Uh, yeah. So when I, when I packed up shop from Tassie and moved to WA, um, I, I got a job and that was the first job that I'd had for like seven years. Cause I'd had my own business, which was humbling. Mm -hmm. Um, it was quite a flexible role, but at the same time I decided to start another kitchen business up on the side, doing things differently. Um, not taking on board any manufacturing or any parts, literally just being a sales and marketing and design agency, which meant that I could scale the business quite quickly um, while doing that, still make a good income and start to, to bring some money in between that and my job. And the more I was learning this coaching thing, uh, the more I started to realize that I was dying on the inside running this kitchen business. Like it wasn't my calling. It wasn't what I was being put on, on earth here to do. And the other job was more just a stable income so I could put food on the table and, and pay my bills. But I made a decision that... Uh, Although prior to that, I was, I was very okay with risk. That experience shook me up a lot that I decided that once my coaching in, income was equivalent to the income of my other, my other roles, I would, I would fully commit to it. And I remember that the moment I made that decision, I think it took me like two and a half, three months before I was up at around like twelve to $15,000 a month in coaching income. And then I cut away the employment job was the first one still thought that I could keep the kitchen business. And then that just started becoming just a drain in energy mm -hmm. and just, there was just no flow there. So I cut that off and that was when things took off the coaching business and I generated nearly a million dollars in the first year of wow. coaching. Like things grew very, very, very quickly um, without a website, without any marketing, just showing up and serving people and being a service. Wow. Really? That's, yeah. that's impressive. <laughs> Yeah. Cause uh, you know, when I first started, I had a website and I was still not making a million a year. I'm still not making a million a year yet, but I'm working on it. We're, we're going to get there. Um, so when, when things were taking off for you, um, when did you decide, okay, now I need to start expanding and what was your plan for that expansion? 
Um, well, I didn't actually. Like uh, the the goal when I kind of started the coaching business is, is I was like, I, I want something that I'm only needed to work a few days a week. I've got financial freedom and I can kind of do it from anywhere in the world. So I set the business up where my coaching was done by a phone call. It wasn't even, it wasn't even video calls back then because I liked to walk around while I was coaching clients. I liked to go on walks or mm-hmm. just be out in nature and kind of I, I felt it allowed a lot more creativity to come through. So that was the plan. And I got to a point where I kind of capped out. I was working two days a week. I'd often take myself to lunch or to movies and things were quite good. And then I met, met this woman and it was three months after I met her. I was like, wow, like I'm playing such a small game here. Like I live a very, very, very good life, but I've got the ability to help a lot more people um, than the, I think it was 18 clients at that time I was working with. And that was when I made the decision to kind of double down. That was, I think, five and a half, maybe six years ago now, made the decision to kind of double down and build a business. And over the last six odd years, it's transitioned from, you know, me obviously doing all the coaching when I started to me hiring other coaches to now, I'm not even involved day to day in the business. You know, I have a team of 14 staff. They do everything from marketing to sales to delivery to our clients. The only thing that, that I'm kind of responsible for is uh, speaking to my general manager once a week, mm. uh, recording podcasts, and really like I provide extra support for, for my team uh, from a leadership perspective and a kind of coaching and training perspective. And then when we run events, I, I like to speak and facilitate the events with our clients. But it's been interesting to notice the last the last six odd years that transition of going and having my identity wrapped up with I'm the coach and I'm here to serve to like, you know what? I don't need to be that person anymore. My team can do it and we can impact more people if I'm not that person because I'm just going to be a bottleneck. The Communicate Influence podcast explores the obvious and less obvious issues and trends affecting PR, communications and marketing. It is essential listening for individuals at the forefront of these industries. Discover the Communicate Influence podcast at communicateinfluence.com or by your favorite podcast listening app. Would you like to be a guest on the Career Challenges podcast? Go to careerchallengespodcast.com to find out how. While you're there, check out other episodes and download them through Google Podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, CastBox, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and more. The Career Challenges Podcast is hosted by me, Kyle Weckerly. I'm a certified professional ghostwriter who works with business thought leaders and industry experts to write polished manuscripts, assess their publishing options, and create book marketing plans. I work with consultants, high-ticket salespeople, coaches, speakers, C-level executives, and business owners. My authors have worked for USAA. Vistage, Booz Allen Hamilton, Austin Technology Council, and Twitch. My authors know that writing a book will help them change the world. They know that the story they tell will create that change. So they want to write a book to serve as a platform for their marketing endeavors. They know a published book will help them secure more speaking gigs, market their expertise, promote a product or service, and more. So reach out to Kyle Weckerly at weckerlywriter.com to start your publishing journey. Maybe you're not ready to start that journey just yet, but you do know that you want to write a book. So where to begin? Well, if you're ready, go to weckerlywriter.com to download 101 questions to ask before writing your book. This will help you get started and will offer guidance on the next steps to turn your ideas, experience, and actual knowledge into a completed manuscript. Just visit weckerlywriter.com to get your free copy today. That's weckerlywriter.com. W E C K. E R L Y W R I T E R dot com. And now back to the Career Challenges podcast. So, do you do or have you been doing a lot of uh, speaking engagements along with your, your coaching? Uh, yeah, yeah. Not so much the last kind of six months, I suppose. Maybe even oh, yeah, last six months, not so much. Prior to that, you have done a lot. Um, traveled around, traveled around the world, done a bunch in the States, uh, throughout Asia, a heap in Australia. Uh, podcasts have been a big one for us, both our own show and, and starring other people's shows. Uh, the last six, six or so months, not so much because, you know, six months ago, it's like, okay, it's time for me now to, to exit. 
and I hired and, and onboarded an integrator and put them on. The last three months I've been chill, chilling out in Bali, uh, writing my first book and kind of just awesome. just sitting, sitting in presence and, and trying to see what's next, you know, what's the next part of the journey is for me in terms of is it building this business bigger? Is it something else? Just kind of really sitting with, um, I guess, gratitude for what's been created so far. Awesome. Awesome. So then of course, I mean, we're, I feel we're still at the very beginning of this, this pandemic of, you know, COVID-19. Um, what are your, I guess your, your opinions on what's going to change for you in the, in your business and especially coaching as a whole? Yeah. Um, very interesting. And there's, there's mixed, there's mixed uh, message in the marketplace because not many people have been through a large pandemic like this before. But many people have been through global financial crises and, and pandemic or not, um, the similarities with global financial crises, you know, like the reality is, is that we will get through this and, you know, a ton of people are going to survive. Um, unfortunately, some people are going to lose their life and some people are going to be affected heavily financially. But I also, you know, the whole premise of the Comeback Game podcast is me interviewing successful business owners and entrepreneurs and understanding how they got to where they are. And every single one of them is more grateful for the challenges and for the adversities and for the times have been knocked down than the times have been lifted up. Mm. And for you and your, your listeners as well, um, you know, think back to those days where you're like, this is the best day of my life. You know, you're going to struggle to remember what those days were unless they're maybe the, the birth of a child, mm. but you can absolutely remember the days of your biggest challenges and adversities. And I, I think in most, most of your listeners, um, perspectives as well they can see the blessings and the positivity that came out of those adversities and experiences and so i see that this right now is a huge reset at a global level and you know napoleon hill speaks about this book think and grow rich that Mm -hmm. with every crisis uh comes the seed of opportunity to the same to equal or greater benefit and if we only even get a seed to equal benefit of what we're experiencing right now like oh man is there going to be a big upside so from our perspective, like I'm totally relaxed in my heart. I feel really at peace with what's happening. We've had a lot of clients that have been hit badly, but in mm-hmm. saying that as well, we've helped them to pivot and we've helped them to maintain profitability uh, in, in these times. Um, so in terms of us, it's business as usual. Like we've got ads out there um, investing in, um, investing in uh, new staff members to, to keep building. We're still executing our plan. We've pivoted slightly uh, messaging to the marketplace uh, we recorded a bunch of new training for our clients, but for us, it's 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 a really good time to be in business and to have the credibility we have because we have the tools to help clients. And just in the last four weeks since things have gotten bad, we've got now a number of case studies that are starting to come out, testimonies of clients that overnight have lost their businesses, you know, gym owners, basketball trainers, dance studios that overnight had to shut down. We've helped them to pivot, go online, and not only are they are they back in revenue and back in business, they're more profitable than they were before. Really? Because we've also helped them negotiate rents down and a whole bunch of other stuff um, as well. So that being said, for us, business as usual, we're still investing in growth. We're positioned very well for this. You know, I've spent the last nine years since I started this business being ready for the next um, recession. And I think, too, there's a huge amount of opportunity, provided that people, A, are able to stay out of their heads and mm-hmm. out of the media and out of the fear and, and, and get back in their heart and their intuition and B, that they're willing to let go of what they've known to, to have worked or be normal in the past. Because mm. the reality is, is that right now what we're experiencing, this is the new normal until it's not. Yeah. So if we're holding on to the notion that in a month's time or two months' time, business will return to the way that it was, like you're going to miss the boat, end up on unemployment and, you know, eventually get lifted back up because the government's never invested as much money as they are right now either in stimulus packages. We've never seen that before. No. So the moment that things start to return, people out of their houses, there's going to be huge uprise because the, the first thing people want to do, it's human nature, they want to return to, to things as normal. So they're going to want to invest money, put money back into the marketplace, go out and shop and buy and do all the stuff they do to fill a sense of normality again, mm-hmm. which is a great opportunity for business owners, but even more so business owners that want to help people out so i think that right now like if you've got listeners that have maybe potentially lost their job like now's the chance for them to to do what they want to do Mm. like there's nothing to lose starting your own business there's nothing to lose trying a new venture because at the moment like a lot of things are being taken away from us Mm. but now if ever before is a chance for people to follow their hearts and follow their dreams and try something they wouldn't have usually tried you know life is forcing us to innovate right now so for me i'm yeah a lot of positivity um 
a lot of crazy things happening to people and my condolences to people that have lost people. Mm-hmm. You know, I, my heart goes out to you for people that have lost their jobs and so forth and huge opportunity. Yeah. Huge opportunity. Definitely. Definitely. So you mentioned earlier uh, pivot and I think that's the big or pivoting to a, a digital, more of a digital uh, presence, um, whatever the business is. And I think that's a huge question right now, at least what I'm seeing on, on LinkedIn and with my, my other uh, business contacts and my business network, because of course a lot of people need to take their business somewhere. If they're not a brick and mortar or if they can't meet people face to face, they obviously have to do a digital or like on a zoom conference call, like what we're doing. Yeah. So, you know, what are, what are a couple, I guess, things that you've learned in your, your experience here, or I guess mindset uh, shifts that need to happen for someone to take their business from, of course, what it was to a more uh, digitally centric type of business. Yeah. First, first and foremost, before they just decide to go digital, I think that um, they need to assess the marketplace and their current clients and work out based on my current clients, is, is there needs they have that we can service? Does our product still service the needs of these clients? Like look at product to market fit. The reality is, is that right now people are still spending money. They are, right? Maybe not as much, maybe not the same areas, but they're absolutely spending money. Look at the lines at the supermarkets, for yeah. argument's sake. Gym equipment, you can't buy it. Gym equipment, you it out. Yeah. People for home gyms, right? Like yeah. people are spending money. They're absolutely spending money right now. But they're probably not spending money on maybe the stuff you used to sell. So the whole point of marketing or having a business is to, to work out what are the problems of the marketplace of my niche and what product or service can I provide to solve those problems? You work that out and, and that's, that's your pivot. Mm-hmm. Right? If that means like for our clients that teach basketball coaching, it's like, do their students still want to learn basketball when they're at home in isolation? Absolutely, more than ever. So can you provide the solution? Yes. How do we do that? So now we've not only maintained current clients, but at the same time, we've also now attracted new clients that we wouldn't have got before because we can go global. Mm-hmm. So when the market corrects and when gyms and studios are able to be opened back up again, we now have a fully fledged community that comes back because we've kept them and maintained them. We've now attracted an online community that we can continue to build. So the business is far better off for making the pivot than not making the pivot. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Awesome. It's great advice. Great advice. Um, so switching gears here a little bit, um, you had mentioned earlier that, you know, with your, your time that you have now that you're starting to, to write a book. So what, uh, what have your, what are your motivations to writing the book? And I guess, you know, can you give us a hint of what's going to be in it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, wanted to write a book for a long time and I just avoided it because I didn't think that I had the time, but also my, my, my written and grammatical skills aren't, um, that amazing. <laughs> Uh, but that being said, you know, for us, we, we, we are serving an international marketplace, but majority of our business is generated through online marketing in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we have a plan to launch in the States in a big way um, come July this year. And so the book really is a positioning tool for us around some of our core IP um, to position ourselves internationally, to get more speaking opportunities and to really solidify um, some of the core um, the core IP that we have and teach our clients. The book is based on uh, nine steps to systemize your business. Mm-hmm. Um, but unlike we've got an ebook that we run nine steps to system, systemize your business, but unlike that, it's more around the steps and psychology required to build a business that can work without you. And so, you know, our kind of core offering to our clients is that we help them to triple their profits and double their time off in 12 months or less. And these nine steps are a crucial part of that because if your business still relies on you, um, you haven't got a business, you've got a job. Mm-hmm. And the reason that we are faring so well and we will grow so well out of this time is that, that I wasn't required in the business. So the moment that this pandemic hit, it meant that I was fully resourced to step back in and innovate from a calm and present place because I wasn't stuck on the tools. I wasn't stuck in operations. And most business owners are like, oh, but I don't want to exit. I want to stay in my business. You know, and it's like, that's cool. But your business still needs to operate without you. Even if you want to work in it, it still mm-hmm. should operate without you because in, until it does, it's not a business, it's a job. Mm-hmm. And we are just revising the first couple of chapters to speak more into the pandemic and the, the COVID-19 and things that are going on and how we've na- navigated us as a business through this and our clients as well. But that's essentially the, the, the working title is the nine steps to systemize your business, the steps and psychology required to build a business that works without you. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Awesome. So, I mean, um, you had mentioned that you, you don't feel you're a strong writer. Um, 
you know, what is, what is the writing process been like for you? Are you enjoying it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've cheated, cheated a little bit. I have a really good copywriter. <laughs> I've been working for years and she watches all of the, the videos that I do, all the audios and out of that she creates the copy for our nurture sequences and our social and things like that and it looks and sounds like me. So essentially all we did is we, we planned out, I planned out the chapters, what I wanted to include. Um, we jump on a Zoom call once a week for an hour. Um, mm-hmm. She essentially interviews me. I share everything that I want to want to put down the chapter and she goes away and pulls it together. And then I go through and kind of give her the yay or the nay around certain sections and color it that way. And it's been a very, very smooth process where we're 11 weeks in. We've, we've nailed uh, to over 10 chapters and over, I think, 55,000 words so wow. far. And we've got four chapters to go, which will be finished in April, ready for publishing in, in May, early June. Awesome. Awesome. So do you already have a publisher lined up? Uh, we'll probably look at self-publishing. We're just starting to look at that now. We'll look at self-publishing. A big part of this will be using it as um, like lead generation, mm-hmm. you know, free right. plus shipping and things like that. But we will look at self-publishing through Amazon and um, Kindle and so forth. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, my next question, uh, I want to preface it this way. Um, Casey Dimchak, he's a previous guest of mine. Uh, he writes copy our marketing copy for books. And during our conversation, uh, my preconceived notion about writing and marketing book is that the marketing comes after writing the book. And he flat out told me that that's a mistake. You don't have to do it in that sequence. You can start your marketing even before you start writing your book. So then my question to you now, uh, even if, even though you're in the middle of writing your book, have you already started thinking about your, your marketing for the book? And if so, what are the steps that you've taken so far? Yeah. Um, absolutely. Like marketing is such a, a key point around it. So um, for us, we're just starting to get serious now. Like uh, ideally two weeks ago, we would have started building the funnel for it. Um, but but resources had to be diverted and, and moved around based on the current state in the marketplace. But, you know, we're really strictly off eight weeks off before having the book. So it'll take us a week to two to put a funnel in place. And then we can start advertising uh, pre copies. We've got a huge database. We've got a big database on the social channels as well that we use. And we'll look at doing a joint venture through um, a bunch of uh, influencers and, and people we've had on our podcast as well. So really for us, the main kind of front end will be paid traffic through the book. But then we'll look at um, using a PR agency to get some uh, publicity across some different platforms, both in Australia and the US as well. Awesome. Awesome. So are you going to do a, a print and, a, and an ebook version? Uh, digital version? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Both, both will be paid, but we'll do a print version like paid, uh, free plus shipping or something. So you can get the book for free, just pay for shipping. Awesome. Awesome. And, our, and audiobooks are, are big right now. Are you, are you contemplating audiobooks? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. We'll do audio as well. Awesome. Awesome. I'm always curious because, you know, um, Ghostwriter and I love books and, and the marketing and all that, but also just the process of turning a book into an audiobook. I'm I'm I love that and I've listened to a lot of audiobooks and so I always you you hear the narrators and it's like okay that's a good narrator that's a bad narrator. So I'm always curious how the process is from the author's point of view um, doing an audiobook. I haven't been able to do an audiobook yet, so I'm always curious about that. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So um, before we go, before we, we finish up, I do want to ask what's what's next for you. You've already mentioned a book, um, but is there anything else that's that's next for you, Barry? Uh, yeah. So there's a, there's a few things. We recently launched an outsourcing business, so mm-hmm. it took us quite a while to to perfect the technique of hiring offshore staff and um, integrating them effectively into your company and culture. And we now have seven uh, seven IT members are based in the Philippines. Uh, so we opened up an outsourcing business towards the end of last year, uh, basically to serve our clients because a lot of them are looking for, you know, cheaper labor that are effective and efficient. And the Filipino staff are just so wonderful to work with. They're highly skilled labor rates. You can pay them a good rate and still see a significant discount of what you'd be paying local staff. So that's something working on this year. And, and really for us, it's just launching internationally, um, media. So that, that would be a big thing for us. That's kind of a, two core projects this year. Um, We've Mm -hmm. got a pretty solid 10 year vision, but this year the the two main things is getting the outsourcing across to all of our clients and to launch internationally. Awesome. Awesome. So if somebody's listening to this uh, podcast and they really want to know more about game changers specifically, or how to connect with you to do uh, more, more coaching for them, how can they connect with you, Barry? 
Uh, yeah, two ways. So one is um, the Comeback Game podcast, which is on Spotify, iTunes, and most of the other podcast channels is a good way. Uh, the other way is just to visit our website, thegamechangers.com.au. Um, and there's a bunch of free resources, resources on there, heap of testimonies, but also opportunity to book a call with one of the team if you want to have a chat and see whether or not we might be a good fit to help you uh, help you to grow and scale your business. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Barry, thank you so much for being on the Career Challenges podcast with me today. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Career Challenges Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and like the Career Challenges Podcast on your favorite podcasting app. Visit careerchallengespodcast.com for more information. And if you really like me, then you'll write a review. And don't forget to pick up your free copy of 101 Questions to Ask before writing your book by visiting weckerlywriter.com. That's W-E-C-K-E-R-L-Y-W-R-I-T-E-R.com.